Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start. The CETTC are back. Cairo talks on transformation and change. And most of you probably know our format. Um, it's a joint series by the DRD, the Freie Universität Berlin, and the Oren Institut Beirut. Um, the CTTC is actually uh, a series, it's a platform to analyze the changes that have been going on in this country since the revolution of the 25th of January 2011. We reflect certain uh, issues, we have been doing so for quite some time, and today we want to focus on the very core of society, the family, love, life and law, the future of family politics in Egypt and Tunisia. We have invited two eminent guests. Um, on my left, they will be introduced by Zara Wessel, who is the representative of the Oren Institute in just a moment. Florian uh, Kostal, the head of the Berlin office of the Freie Universität, is um, our third partner on board for the CTTC. Now, I don't know, Sara, um, why there's only women on the panel. I don't know whether that's politically correct when we talk about family. <laughs> this is something you may want to reflect upon. Um, well, I did already. <laughs> good, good. You, will, you will tell us something in a moment. I just would like to um, highlight that this is actually something that is meant as a dialogue. Um, we welcome very much your contribution. Um, and we always have what I call the second half, i.e. Um, we have uh, prepared something for afterwards, something to eat and to drink. And we would like to continue the dialogue with you after the event. Now, Sarah. I would like to hand over to you, and uh, I wish all of us a very enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And also from my side, I would like to welcome you very much to the 13th talk, uh, the CTTC on Love, Life and Law, the Future of Family Politics in Egypt and Tunisia. Um, Special welcome, of course, uh, to our speakers, Professor Katre and uh, Dr. Vorhofer. Uh, I will introduce you in a minute to them. I just wanted to say a few words about the idea and the concept of uh, uh, the topic today. Um, and it might reflect as well what uh, Dr. Harms said, uh, why only women are sitting here. Um, I think that family politics is always a little bit treated as a soft topic and as a harmless topic somehow. But it's basically a very powerful governmental tool to organize society. Um, I mean, it basically affects the reproduction of society, how you use this kind of tools, how you want to discipline the society. Uh, so I think it's not a soft topic at all. It's a very hard topic. And um, uh, I think our two speakers uh, will tell us a lot about uh, what happened in Egypt in the last 30 years and how it will go on uh, in the future, maybe, and in Tunisia, of course. Um, so basically, the questions uh, we um, want to discuss today are what are the norms pertaining to the organization of families and how important are religious beliefs and traditions in this regard? Um, so I'd like to introduce you first to Professor Sena Patra. She is uh, a researcher of the Social Science uh, Research Center at American University uh, of Cairo, but she's also a professor of statistics at the Faculty of Economics and Political Science at the Cairo University. Um, in her research, she is specifically interested in population aging, health inequities, demographic, demographic change, and gender difference in health in the uh, Arabic region. And she has a long list of uh, very interesting publications, so I, I just want to mention two that might be very interesting for our topic today. Um, but you can add, of course, some more if you want. Um, the one is uh, differences in levels of social integration among older women and men in Egypt. Uh, another article is on social conditions in, and urban health inequities, realities, challenges, and opportunities to transform the urban landscape through research and action. Um, so the presentation she's going to ever, uh, give us today provides a brief overview of the different uh, demographic and socio-economic forces um, that affected the Egyptian family over the last uh, three decades. And then uh, we'll also talk a little bit about how this affected the families of nowadays and maybe in the future. And then 
Dr. Maike Vorhöfe to my left side. Um, she's a researcher at, from transregionale Studien, um, yeah, trans, uh, from transregional studies of the Wissenschaftskolleg uh, of Berlin. Um, so she is basically a legal anthropologist um, who specializes in studying law in, in a very broad sense. Um, um, so, so her research interest is in the interplay between formal and informal structures um, and um, informal norms in uh, public debates on the law. So she published uh, also a lot and especially two books related to our topic, uh, Family Law in Islam, and another one, uh, Gender and Divorce in North Africa. Um, so basically, she will talk to today uh, with focus on Tunisia, where she also stayed for two years for her field work. And she will uh, examine the renegotiation of family norms and the outcome of these uh, negotiations in practice in Tunis, uh, in Tunisia, before, before and after the uprisings. Um, in January 2011. So then I would like to hand over. Every, you know the rules a little bit, it's 15 to 20 minutes for each speaker, and then I hand over, and then we open the uh, floor to the public for questions. And you want, of course, you can. Uh, hello everyone, welcome and thank you for your uh, interest in this topic. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm not very used to speaking in a microphone, as you can see. Does it work? Okay. <laughs> so, in this short presentation, I'd like to talk about the debate um, on women's rights and family law in present-day Tunisia. So, actually more about uh, the debates after the revolution, not so much about before the revolution. Um, Tunisia is famous both in the Muslim world but also beyond for its um, progressive family code that dates from 1956, so from right after Tunisian independence. And this code is famous because it abolished repudiation and polygamy, because it introduced a minimum marriage age and it abolished, uh, abolished um, marriage guardianship. But of course at the same time it was imposed um, personal status code. So it did not come about in a democratic way and is not necessarily in conformity with what Tunisians want with respect to family law and family life. Since the Tunisian revolution of 14 January 2011, Tunisia has been going through what I call a phase of renegotiation of uh, what the new Tunisia should look like and uh, while the Tunisian revolution was a social, economic and political revolution, um, you can see that the debates afterwards have been centering around much more ideological issues, such as women's rights and family law. This focus on women's rights in the debates shows that the Tunisian transition takes place in a setting that is demarcated, demarcated by ideological struggles between, on the one hand, people who want to uh, hold on to a certain status quo and people who want to break with that status quo and then the people who want to hold on to the status quo in the field of family law and women's rights um, will consider this status quo as um, modernized, uh, as western, uh, but also as Tunisian and as feminist with all its positive connotations. Whereas those people who want to break away from this status quo uh, will define it as too westernized, not true to Tunisian Arabo-Islamic uh, culture and uh, authoritarian and non-democratic. Um, I think that um, the present day Tunisian debates on these topics are mostly characterized by a lot of fear, uh, a fear for change and uh, this fear is expressed in a lot of demonstrations that take place um, almost like in a certain period even on a, almost on a daily basis in Tunisia and these fears are uh, were of course fueled with the by the outcome of the first Tunisian elections which took place on 23 October 2011 where the Islamist movement and Nahda won 40% of the votes. And so this was a reason for people who want to hold on to the status of women. This was a reason to fear for change. Also, the government that was then formed on the basis of these elections 
kind of fueled these fears by declarations that they made in the media and in press conferences, uh, especially members from the uh, Anahda movement saying that they wanted to reintroduce polygamy, that they wanted to abolish adoption, which is legal in Tunisia, um, that they wanted to install a pension for women who decide to stay at home instead of going to work. Um, and they also want, well, th so there were a couple, oh yeah, and there was this, there was this another member who said that all the state aid that exists in Tunisia for single mothers um, is a shame for uh, Tunisian Arabo-Islamic culture and so sh should be abolished. Um, so you could see this, these kinds of declarations as some sort of provocations and as fueling a very fierce debate. But at the same time, what you see in practice is that such declarations by an Nahda, but also by the government at large, did not culminate in actual legislative changes. And this has two reasons. In the first place, Tunisia is currently govern governed by an interim government, which has very limited legislative powers. So um, it simply cannot change the personal status quo, for example. The current um, representative body, which is a, an assembly, is not a parliament. It is a constitutional assembly, which is to draft a new constitution. That's actually its, its competence. So that's w one reason why Anahda and other government members can say as much as they want about what they want to change, but they cannot actually do it for the time being. A second reason, apart from this competence problem, is that, and this may be a difference between Tunisia and Egypt, but I do not know enough about Egypt to really make, that, to make a point out of that, is that the Anahda movement, or the Islamist movements in general, have much less legitimacy in Tunisia. So they do not have sufficient legitimacy to actually bring about changes in the field of family uh, law and women's rights. This is... Um, so even if an Nahda obtained 40% of the votes in these elections, only 50% of the Tunisians who were eligible to vote did so. So only two in five, two in 10 Tunisians who voted. Yeah, okay. And so, and many people who voted for an Nahda did not vote an Nahda for ideological reasons. So they voted an Nahda for um, reasons that are connected to really wanting to distance from the pre-revolutionary regime, not because they wanted to change family law, for example, or reintroduce, like, I don't know what, Islamic kind of things. So what you see is you have all these debates, but actually in practice it doesn't, it doesn't mean a lot, except where the constitution is concerned, because the constitutional assembly has 40% members of Anahda, and the Constitutional Assembly is actually going to make, and now made, a new constitution. So it is there that the actual um, stakes are in the constitution. So the debates on the new constitution, so the, the old constitution, which dated from 1959, was actually suspended, not for ideological reasons, but because it did not protect the rule of law, obviously. There was too much power with the president. So the idea was to suspend the constitution and to, to look at this aspect of the constitution. But then what you see in practice is that all the debates on the constitution were on ideological issues again, and not on political issues or economic or social issues. And so the fiercest debate on the constitution was actually about women's rights. Because there was this working group within the constitutional assembly, uh, which is called the Working Group for Rights and Liberties, which proposed to insert an article in the new constitution saying that women are complementary to men in the family and in the fatherland. And so there was this huge debate. And what is interesting about, about this proposal is that this working group was not at all only a Nahda. It was people from various political parties and it was mainly women. And so the reaction among parts of society was the cons what is this constitutional assembly like? They do not have any legitimacy at all. Whereas, of course, they had legitimacy because they had been elected. Um, so what was the outcome of these debates so far? So as you probably know, uh, Tunisia has a new constitution since a couple of weeks. It took some time, but it's finally there. Um, 
And the article on complement on complementarity, on complementarity of the of the woman does not feature in the new constitution. On the contrary, actually, the core article on women's rights provides the state engages in protecting the achievements of women's rights and uh, in reinforcing them. This is Article 46 of the Constitution. And so what is interesting is that this goes even further than what people have been demanding. So it's not only about um, keeping the status quo, but even reinforcing a certain status quo, which is interesting, right, in this uh, political um, situation. And I think that an explanation for this decision lies in the particular polit uh, political context of the moment in which the uh, constitution was voted. Um, the vote on the constitution took place in a context where the call for extreme change had kind of lost legitimacy uh, due to a series of political murders and so-called terrorist attacks. Um, public opinion shifted away from this demand for uh, change. And so this demand for change, even in the field of family law, kind of lost legitimacy. However, no matter how important uh, this decision to insert Article 46 in the new constitution may be, uh, for symbolical reasons, it is merely symbolical because constitutions, I mean, they are very important to kind of bring about an identity for a new state. And I think post-revolutionary Tunisia, you can call it a new, like the building of a new state. Um, it is only a symbolical thing. So what the exact um, future of women's rights and family law is, will be played out on different levels, namely the legislative level, once there will be a parliament that actually has legi legislative competences, but also on the practical level, and I want to end with uh, a note on that. So even if the interim government did not have legislative competences, it did have many other competences, and what it did was, for example, uh, legalizing a lot of associations, a lot of NGOs. And some of these NGO NGOs have as their kind of point of existence the reinstallment of Islamic morality in public space. And so what these NGOs do is they address women in the street to tell them how to dress and how to behave. And so it is here, I think, that the stakes are more when, where women's rights and, and family law is concerned than on the level of the Constitution, even if the debates have been focusing on the Constitution. I'd like to leave it at that. And we can talk more about the um, particularities of the debates uh, in the Q&A. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Michael, for this very interesting talk. Um, so perhaps I can summarize some, some aspects of it, and you might correct me if I mis misunderstood something. Um, so as far as I understood, it's, uh, um, in Tunisia, it's obviously that people are a little bit divided in the question uh, what uh, concerns the, like women rights. Um, so there are quite a huge amount of people who want to hold up the status quo, which is basically this progressive code with uh, the idea that you have a minimum age to marry and uh, uh, that women are allowed to divorce. And then the others want you to break away from the status quo and, and um, not only people from the NAFTA, but, but very much um, in support of the NAFTA, I assume. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, but um, I mean, what I think what you also stress is a little bit this problem between the, the legal things that you might have the law, but then again uh, to enforce it in practice as well. I think this might uh, play in, uh, plays always an important role, and this is why it's quite interesting as well that they in in the constitution they really stated it's not only about the, the protecting of women's rights but also enforcing them. Um, And what I personally also found very interesting that this uh, working group that uh, were working on the women's rights question in the constitution were uh, quite a diverse group, obviously, of from different members, uh, but still were not considered as being legitimate, really, although they were somehow legitimate. So we again see this question of who is, even when they might be elected, and you still can question if they are accepted as being legitimate. Yeah, right. so, yeah. Okay, then. Um, I would like to uh, hand over to Professor Zeyna.
and now we get a lot of numbers. Yes. I, I heard. <laughs> I don't know, I'm in a bad situation now. She has been talking about legal, philosophy, ideology, and big words, which I don't know anything about it, but hey, bear with me. I'm a statistician. So you're going to have lots and lots of numbers. Um, okay, here. Okay. What I'm going to do in this presentation is that I'm going to talk about the Egyptian family. Actually, I'm not talking about what happened after the revolution, but in my talk, you're going to understand why the revolution came, came about. Okay? You'll find that lots of things that has been pushing people in order to revolt. So what I'm presenting here is a profile of the Egyptian family, current status, and future expectations. Um, Egypt, like any other Arab countries, has been going through a lot of changes. Demography, socioeconomics, so many things that happened over the past 30 years. These changes have challenged a lot of the dynamics that's going within the family. It's, it's changing what's happening within the family. It's overburdening some of the people. It's, uh, actually, it's not overburdening some of them. It's overburdening everybody in the family. Okay? So, uh, in consequence, these challenges has, uh, has resulted in a redefinition of the, the, the role within the families, particularly the gender roles. I'm going to go very briefly on the changes. Total population in the census in 1976 was 38 million. Currently, we are at 85 million. So, in less than more. 35 years, we have more than that. And total fertility, which is the number of children that a woman would, uh, would have over, uh, through, uh, throughout her life, declined from five into three children. Actually, we have a problem with the three. We cannot go beyond the three. We ask everybody, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, everybody wants three. Two girls, one boy. <laughs> Declines in fertility and uh, mortality, which is, has been declining forever because of the medical advancement and uh, also the adoption of a good life, a good standard of living, has resulted in two phenomena that Egypt will experience in the near future. The first one is the increase in the sheer number and the proportion of young people. In the next 20 years, we're going to have the largest cohort of young people in our history because they are the production of the fertility that was high about 10 or 20 years ago. So they are shifting, and in about 40 years, we're going to have the largest cohort of elderly people. So we're going into a change in the demography that we have to be well prepared for it. Those young people, are we prepared to accommodate them from the education part, from the employment part, from the marriage part, and when they grow old, are we prepared to take care of them? This is the question that we can ask. From the economic, uh, on the economic front, I put a very positive picture. I said that there is a five-fold increase in the gross domestic product uh, between, uh, two th uh, between 2000 and uh, 1980 and 2010. There is an increase in absolute size of the labor force, and women has uh, increased their participation in the labor market, and please pay attention to the women, because as Hans was saying, it's, there is a gender bias on the, uh, over here, yes, there is gender bias. I'm biased to gender. I'm not a feminist, but I'm very biased. <laughs> One third of the work of women, they are working as professional or technical staff, which it's a demanding job. Uh, women also comprise 26% of the professional and managerial staff in Egypt. On the social front, literacy has been declining. We achieved a lot. We went from 62% uh, illiterate to 29%. There was a decrease in illiteracy rate among women, particularly among the young women, in which the, the decline uh, went from 46 in 1990 to 15.4 in 2010. 
after significant achievement among the, uh, the young girls, enrollment is increasing, it's almost universal, and 39% um, of young women aged 19 and 22 completed secondary in 1988, it increased to 69. So women are achieving. <coughs> On the policy uh, side, there was a recognition of women's rights before the revolution. There was a movement, a gender, uh, you know, there, is a, there was a feminist movement. They uh, emphasized women's rights in the family. They had better access to education for women. They involved women and young people. They tried to reach out for the people. So what, what went wrong? If there's all these good things happening, what went wrong? Just to set the stage for what we are in Egypt as a family. This is a quote that I got it from Sahel Joseph. She's uh, an anthropologist. She's a very famous anthropologist, work on the Arab families. And she said that we have patriarchal connectivity. It's a model in which, uh, it's a model which is supported by culture that privilege kid structure and morality and diet. It endorses the production of relational self. So I'll, I'll be identified through other people, okay? That are organized for gendered, male-female hierarchy, and aged, older, young domination. In other words, it supports the production of self who respond to the involvement of others. All the people are imprinting on me, shaping the self, privilege the involvement of others, particularly by gender and age. So we're all shaped by how other people are looking at us. We're always looking at ourselves as the image of how people see us. And they have to influence our back. Question that I'm posing in this presentation, so what happens? When we are achieving, we have the tradition. There is the conflict between the two of them. What's happening to the women and the family in this situation? Actually, what I'm doing, I decided to go through the family from young people to marriage and divorce and older people, and finally, I'm going to show you who's carrying all the burden. For young people, we have education. We said that we're going to have the what they call it demographic window or demographic dividend, in which we have a huge number, a large cohort of population, aged uh, 15 to 35 and it's going to be the largest one. Quality of school, 26.9. These are data coming from a site, which is uh, it's a survey of young people in Egypt carried out by, by the Population Council in Egypt, uh, Population Council, the International Population Council, but the branch for the Middle East. They said that in Egypt, 20, uh, about 27% uh, reported being in a school with multiple checks, so bad. 38 reported that the seats were broken. 14% said that it's not enough seating. 32 uh, they reported broken windows. 23 or 24% overcrowded classes. So this is the quality of school that we have. The quality of learning experience, we have 16.6 dislike instructors. We have 28 instructors were inaccessible. 24% in instructors were unrespectful. Uh, the books are very expensive for a quarter. One third said that uh, they don't prepare us for the labor market in schools. So we have a problem in education. So what's the solution? Solution was found in the private tutoring. Private tutoring was uh, uh, carried out by 50% of the students. They are receiving private tutoring. And the cost was overburdening the family, whether it's uh, rich family or poor family, because the level of the private tutoring expenses varies with the level of the uh, family. It amounts to about uh, 200 pounds per child among the wealthier, 20% of the family, and uh, less than almost 50, uh, 50 pounds for the uh, poorest. So if you have three children, I have to pay 150 every month until the child graduates. What's the solution, other solution? The only solution that we have, mothers, take care of your children, study with them. So we end up saying that 42% of the mothers were helping their children with their homework. Okay, so we have mothers here carrying the bird. Employment, 
being economically active, a female was 30%, a male was 61%. Uh, this is for age 15 to 29, okay? Uh, being economically active among those who are not currently in school, because you might be in 15, you're, you're in school. So it was 17 for female and 83 for males. 50% of those working young people were working in, as a temporary, 35 for female, 19 for working uh, males, and seasonal, which is nine for uh, males and 27 for females. So there is no stability there, not at all. Employment structure, 44 of young people work in informal private regular wage. So they, are, they don't have a contract, but they regularly work. 12% uh, of them works in governmental sector and the majority were from among the, the female. 22.6% uh, of young people work in irregular wage, which is uh, temporary, no contract, nothing. You're just called upon when we need you. So this is a situation of employment. I'm educated, I'm very well educated, but I cannot find work. Working condition, 53 of the young people complained of low wage. 42 in private sector complain from long hour working hours. 38 in private sector complain from exhausting workload. Unemployment, 12, uh, let's say 13% of young men and 31% of uh, young women were unemployed. <coughs> unemployment increased with education. So among secondary educated male, 20%, almost 20% of them were not finding work, although they are looking for it. For uh, young female, there was 30%. It exceeds 30%. It actually reached to 40% among secondary educated. So, we <coughs> have children having problem with education. They cannot find work, and they're staying home. Think of it, we're coming back to home. They are staying home. We have this tradition that young people don't leave home until they are married or they have to travel somewhere in order to earn a degree or to work. Now, I need to marry my son or my daughter. What happened is that I'm presenting for you, it's a very simple uh, comparison between 1992 and 2008, which is not that far away, it's 16 years. If you look at it, for women aged 15 to 49, you find that uh, never marriage is increasing slightly. Marriage is decreasing, widowhood is decreasing, and separatism is increasing, which is a pattern that we all observe in our society. There is a huge cohort of young women who never marry. Come after that, marriage is going down. Divorce and wid widowhood because of the longevity of people, people living longer, so widowhood is declining, and separation is on the, on the rise. This is among women 20 <coughs> to 35 in 16 years, and, and never married increased by 5%, and married decreased by almost 4%, and there is nothing about divorce and, and widowhood. It's not that much of a change. So what's happening? Young women are not getting married, and they are staying home also, served by their mothers and the family. They are protected by the family and marriage is going down. Actually, what happened is that the median age of marriage increased, but proportion of the people who are marrying young is increasing. So what's going on with the marriage market? Gender balance. They are saying there is an abundance of women for men, and this is the Islamists start promoting, saying, oh, let's go for polygamy. <laughs> Suitability and preference. It's not only having a man, it has to be a man who was suitable for me. So we have to investigate, is there suitable men for those educated women who are gaining education and getting involved and engaged with the uh, general life? Financial issue, I'm gonna talk about it in a few seconds, and chances to meet. And this is a big issue that I asked one of our young a junior researcher who hasn't been married uh, and she's 28 now. And she was complaining, I'll tell you what she said. The cost of marriage in the has, which is
which is uh, the furniture. Uh, on average, this is this is an estimate for 2000 uh, for 2009. I think it's it's underestimating it. It's 30,000, 35,000 uh, pounds. It varies with the economic status. It ranges between 21,000 for the elite and reached to uh, 57 for the richest 20 percent of the population. I think if you have if you have a two children, so you need 42,000 if you're a rich, uh, poor, uneducated person. If you have uh, two daughters, two sons, you have to have at least 107 on the side just for furniture, quote unquote. Chances to meet. I'm going to tell you what I asked my junior researcher, why you're not married? And she said, I work at the social research center of the American University. All the people working there are women. I finish work at 6 o'clock. I go home. I'm supposed to mingle with other people. My father is a conservative. So if I mingle, I should mingle with my girlfriends. If I mingle with a man, I'm impolite. So what should I do? You can tell me, should I go into the internet and pick a man and say, this is what I want? This is exactly her words. So most of the Egyptians now are facing this problem. They work, if they are working, they are working from nine till seven. If they have the chance to go out, our conservative traditional uh, society is banning her from communicating with other gender because she would be implant. So she has to hang on with her best friends. The only way she will get married is through what they call it uh, here. Go as son or not. Somebody would introduce husband for me, which is not acceptable for all the young women because they need to know that guy. He's, she's not a commodity. He's coming to check her if she has good teeth and she has a good body and soft hair. Just so this is the chance to me. So what are, what's happening up till now? Educated, staying at home, not working. They are not married. They are frustrated with all the conservative and the constraints surrounding them. Okay, fine, let's go. They get married, thank God. After they get married, they decided that this is not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so what should we do? I need a divorce. I need a divorce. No, you're not going to get a divorce. I'm a man. I'm the one who's going to divorce you. She go to Hola. <laughs> What's Hola? Hola is uh, the unilateral um, divorce initiated by women. It was passed in the uh, personal status law in Article 20 uh, that the woman can initiate a divorce if she satisfies the, uh, the following conditions. Renounce their outstanding financial uh, entitlement, pay back the dower, go through three months period of reconciliation, explicitly declare in a court that she hate living with her husband. And if she continue living with her husband, they gotta go against God's will. They gotta do something wrong against God's will. Okay, so what's the problem with Hola? When it passed, everybody was saying, women are gonna be free, they gonna get married every day, they gonna allow their husbands the next day, they have this freedom. What happened is that it resolved a few problems that were stuck in the court. But beyond this, let me tell you what happened. In this law, they say that the woman has to pay back the dowry. Okay? What happened in the Egyptian contract, marriage contract, that we don't state how much the dowry is. And we have two parts of it. One up front and one, one at the end of the marriage. So what happened, we usually say 10 pounds. The woman goes to the court, she's very happy, she's got to pay him the 10 pounds and get free. The man would start saying, no, but this is not what I paid, I paid more than that. The judge would take control at that moment and say, okay, let's estimate, tell me how much you paid. And since the judge is the man, and the man is uh, the one who's complaining, they sympathize. So they start asking questions, how much did you pay? So the husband come back and say, okay, 
I pay this amount of money up front. I have to pay this amount of the money in, in the, uh, at the end of the marriage. And I pay the engagement ring. And there's what we call it, the, uh, the furniture list. Uh, I sign for it. So I need the, 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 the money listed on that furniture list because it's the amount of money I paid. So the woman is asked to pay for all these four items. All these four items, it's a huge fortune. We just said, we said for furniture is 21,000 for the electorate. Think about it, she has to pay all this. And she's actually applying for Hora because her husband is not paying for her living. And she sold the engagement ring in order to feed her children. What's happening is that at that point, the man takes the upper hand. And he sets her and tells her, recline all your entitlement and I'll give you your divorce right now. And it doesn't turn into Hola because Hola is a bad word for Egyptian men. So he's, after being having this right for women, they are declining it just for the sake of getting divorced. What happened is that one of our colleagues at SRC, she did a field work and she discovered that during the reconcilement period, the women are being pushed so much that 60% will go for divorce, divorce on, on an agreement. And the, 40, the only 40% will go for the court. The 40% most likely they are the rich people who can afford to pay the money and give the man the title Mahlua. Okay? Sorry for the bad, bad part of it. All the people, those are parents, they are, uh, we have to take care of them. Population aging is and will be dominated by women. There is a five years difference between men and women. Actually, it's not five, it's seven years difference between men and women in their expectation of life, how much they're gonna live according to what's happening now. There is 126 women per men currently. So women are the majority. However, women pay for that survival. They are sicker, they have problems where activities of daily living, taking shower, eating, and moving from bed to sleep, this is activity of daily living. They have problems with uh, taking their medication, going to the bank, and coming back and uh, you know, receiving their uh, retirement pension. They have limitation in, in, uh, in activities, uh, in physical activities, raising their, their hand, walking a distance. And uh, they have about 80% of women has uh, some chronic disease compared to 60%. So yes, we are living longer, but we're sicker. I used to say, we kill the men and we warn them so we get sick. <laughs> Adding to that, women are more likely to be with us because husband will pass away and she's going to end up with it. Women are less educated up till now. We haven't reached to the 100% uh, literacy rate for women. They rarely participate in the labor market. We've seen that young women are not participating in the labor market because either they don't find jobs or they are not interested. And as a result, they are not covered by social security. So they are available. They need somebody to take care of them. Intergenerational support, we have residents. This is the traditional way of supporting your elderly parent is that let's live together, I'll take care of you. And uh, in this case, we found that between 1988 and 2000, we found that uh, living alone, many elderly decided that I'm not going to live with anybody. This is confining my freedom. I have, I'm staying at my home. And any, if anybody wants to come, let's join me. Empty nest, which is having the husband and wife only living together, it has been increasing, which is also expression of freedom. I don't want anybody to constrain my life. Uh, living with unmarried children, because <coughs> the children are staying home. They are not working, they are not getting married, so it's, in, it's equally. Living with married children is declining, which, which, which is the tradition. Here, <coughs> probability of living for if I, if I have a man who's, uh, you know, the average man in Egypt, if he has no sons and three daughters, he's most likely to live with his children by the probability is 80%. Uh, However, if he has three sons, 
most likely he's going to be living with uh, his married son. This is something that needs a big explanation. Um, our traditions say that women are the provider of hands-on and emotional support to the parents. Men are responsible for the financial support. In this chart, I was trying to find out whether men and women differ in financial support if I control the ability to have resources by working. SF means a son supporting your father, and DF, a daughter supporting your father. You're going to find that there is no difference in the level while they are not working. So if the son is not working or the daughter is not working, the two of them are provided for the, kid, for the father. And the, the one that next to it, if they are not working, they are supporting the mother. Mother is receiving much more. Daughters are also supporting the mother. The points in the middle is the level. The interval is uh, what you call this, that is what you call this interval. It's how much yani, you trust, or the range of it. With the same token, you're going to find that the sons and daughters provide the same for the father, and sons and daughters provide almost the same level for the mother which means that beside the hands-on support that women are giving to their parents, beside the emotional support they are providing to their parents, they are now contributing to the financial support of their parents. So what's happening? We have the sandwich generation. We call it sandwich generation because those are the generation in the middle. They are supporting their elderly, and they are supporting young children, not young young adults children. Middle age generation who has uh, to care for their <coughs> elderly parents and children. President is not an issue. If the, my mother is living with me, thank God she's living with me. Because if she's not living with me, I have the other chef, the third chef, caring for my children, attending my work, and going to my mother's house to care for them. Because she decided she wants to live there. Support for parents and young children was based on the culture divine, defined uh, gender roles. Women assigned the hands-on, uh, men are assigned the finance. With access to financial resources, we find that women are providing hands-on. I'm done, I'm done, this is the last one. <laughs> so uh, women are also providing financial support. They feel that it's their attachment to their parents that they have to give back to how much they invested them in them. So women are now experiencing the triple shift, home, work, and care for the elderly. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sainer. Uh, I'm getting a little bit worried, actually, because um, the increase of widows and the problem of the divorce might lead me to the conclusion that they poison their husbands. So I think uh, men are living very dangerous, uh, in dangerous times. Um, no, I think there was a very, very dense um, presentation. No, no, that was great. So the, uh, basically showing the whole life cycle from, from not marrying, marrying, divorce, <coughs> um, from the demographic changes. Uh, Egypt uh, is, is challenge, uh, challenging. Um, so I think there are some few, uh, some points I would like to stress. Um, so first, of course, this demographic problem um, that y you have a huge cohort of, of very young people that grow older and then, of course, become also uh, a, a challenge to deal with the social systems. And since social systems are, are not uh, not that good, um, that this will also become a problem for the elderly generation and then reflect back on how um, the children of the elderly can deal with that. Um, so perhaps the solution would be to, to mix up Germany and Egypt because we have to... Uh, the, the, the I, I think... All your <laughs> <laughs> um, I um, found very interesting the, the, the concept you presented on this patriarchal connectivity and on the gender because it stresses also a little bit that um, very often there is this prevalent picture that men oppress women, but when we look about an, on this concept that gender roles are reproduced by men and women themselves, then we see also women as part of this reproduction of, uh, of the social roles, so, so they are part of it. So uh, I want to say 
men and women obviously have to talk to each other in order if they want to change certain traditions, they can't hold on uh, any longer. Um, and I think what, what, uh, what you also stressed um, is um, that the family and, and the economic role of the family for, for the survival of the children, that it's basically really a, a network in terms of um, when the state is not providing the money, you are unemployed, that the family is, um, is the main power that uh, gives you the chance to, to survive. Um, so it's very difficult, uh, obviously, to, to make your own, find your own way in independently when you're always depending on, on, on the family, also in financial terms. Um, so I, I saw some connections between your two presentations as well. Again, um, one, there's this, obviously, again, this gap between the legal texts and, and the enforcement of the law that, I mean, the social rules are still very important. And that is, of course, uh, very difficult then for the for another generation that might not follow these traditional rules um, to deal with their parents, and being in this economic dependency of, of, of the of the parents, um, how can you deal then with that in, in dis discussing these kind of things and asking for other um, yeah other other changes. Um, yeah, and uh, as you pointed out, of all that, it's of course you have this uh, chance to do divorce legally, but then again, um, in, in practice, it's very, very difficult. So how can we deal with that? But we have legal text, but um, people do not follow this legal text in a sense because the social pressures are so high that you just can't enforce them uh, properly. So I think this is a, a huge debate also in, in the constitution, as we have also seen in uh, Tunisia. So these are just a few aspects. I um, I found uh, very interesting, but I'm sure the audience has much more questions and things they might uh, add or uh, ask. So I would like to hand over to the to the audience. So perhaps we collect always like three to four questions, and then I let you answer. Is that yeah? Oh yeah. Right, I've seen a question over there already. Um, Professor Zainab, um, thank you very much for the very informative uh, presentation and the uh, very dense numbers on the st statistical studies and uh, I think behind this is a very intensive study on surveys. Um, I'm Egyptian and um, I think, yeah, it's clear. <laughs> I think in, in this study you are, ref you are reflecting the society in big cities. What about the countryside? What about the villages in, 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 other, in other parts of Egypt here? Yeah. You're from Florian Kustad. Yeah, thank you very much for both of your presentations. Um, I think uh, one aspect that uh, contrasts very well in your presentation is that uh, uh, we see actually that uh, the discussion on family law, if we talk about the political process, is always sort of stuck in an identity debate, or so always a ideological debate. But we also see that uh, the consequences of family policy are mainly demographic, are social, are economic. So I was wondering, in the Tunisian debate and in the Egyptian debate, did we ever have politicians who were raising these demographic problems, who were approaching these family policies as economic and social problems, or in economic and social terms, and not as much in identity terms? Thank you. Jan? Thank you very much to both of you. I was very much puzzled by the uh, example of the sandwich generation that you mentioned at the end. And let's say this double pressure, especially to the women, they have to care about their parents and they have to care about their kids and they have to care about their husband. And I just wonder, uh, I know from Iraq that it's really a problem that parents in an older age get often neglected within their families, which is a taboo topic because the 
sandwich generation in the middle cannot perform to care about the kids themselves and the parents. And that's really a big problem, obviously, at least in Iraq. And do you know anything about this situation of neglected parents? And as you said, that in 40 years we can expect the biggest share of older people in Egypt. If that is a problem that has been recognized and that there are already strategies how to improve the situation of elder people. So one more question for the first round. Yep. Thank you for the for both presentations. Um, may I have two questions on Tunisia, please? Um, one would refer to your um, explanations of the role of the constitution. To me, it's not only symbolic. It's actually the ground, the frame, according to which we're going to adopt future laws. So um, I was wondering if there is more in the new constitution written about the family <coughs> politics and family law um, other than this um, single line that you quoted, which referred again to the um, rights of women, which again leaves out the men and doesn't actually define what it means. What are the rights of women? How are they defined according to what frame? And the other question would refer to your um, to the implementation or the imposition of the identity politics in the streets. Um, you said that there were several civil society organizations that are actually performing their super marvelous duty to you know teach women how to dress and how to behave. Are they doing the same thing to men, first of all? And secondly, um, who are these NGOs, who are these people? Are they related to any political leaning, any ideological leaning? And where do they operate? Or do they operate mostly in Tunis, in, um, but it's just basically if you could elaborate on this, please. Thank you. Good in. I get in one start, yeah. We, in the second round, we make it the other way, okay. so. Um, so first for Florian about um, whether politicians also address family law and women's rights in a different context and only in identitarian terms. Um, actually, what, so these points that were made by members of Anahda, for example, the point about single mothers, um, that was a point that was made very much in social terms. So we have to uh, we have to transform society in a way so, so that we don't have single mothers anymore. Which in a way comes back to an identitarian argument, I think. Um, then this um, point in the Anahda party program about giving a pension to women who want to stay at home is obviously, even if it wasn't put that way, it wasn't put in economic terms, but it is obviously a way to deal with unemployment, right? Um, and then something I wanted to say something actually about uh, demo uh, demography as well. Um, I think that Tunisia simply does not so demographic problems do not really play a role in Tunisia because Tunisia is one of the countries or is actually the country in the region that had very um, effective family planning policy in the 1950s and 60s with um, the legalization of abortion, for example. Um, there are only 10 million Tunisians in Tunisia. There's one million of Tunisians in France. Um, so that problem doesn't really play a role, nor does it in, in, in the discussion. Then for you, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Hi, Natasha. Um, there is not, so there is not something specific about family law in the new constitution. And I think we disagree about the symbolical value of the Constitution, also because um, I know what limited um, influence the previous Constitution had on practice, on both legislation and on practice by judges. Even if judges were supposed to apply the Constitution in their practices, they did not. Um, then the practice of these NGOs, so I know about one particular NGO. This is, f I mean, you should not exaggerate it either. This particular NGO is 14 men who work in Tunis and um, 
I lived in, uh, I don't know if you know Tunis, but so I lived in uh, Geil uh, Omran, Frans Wiel, and they were present there um, handing out leaflets with lists of behavior, and these lists were not only addressed to women. So, and, so, and I think that's a very important point. Um, who the men are, I don't know exactly who they are. I know they are bearded, and, um, but we do not, like in Tunisia you now have also a Salafist uh, political party that has been uh, authorized, and I don't know if they, if to which, so if they belong to Nahda or to the other, or to neither, I have no idea. <coughs> no, but I, th I, th I also have a problem with that in the sense that I feel that the Islamist or Salafi narrative is a very much a slippery slope and changes very much from person to person as well, and for a person also changes over time. So uh, that's all I can say about about this. Uh. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think. So I'm I have to look it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my dear Egyptian. <laughs> uh, let me start again saying I'm a statistician. So I know about random, about representation. Trust me, we are representing the whole country. So it's about big cities, rural area, upper, lower, urban government rate, everything. I'm giving you the average. And you can barely survive the average. How about if I go into things? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so trust me, we have large, large surveys. And if you want a list of them, I can tell you on top of my head, there is tons of them. And they usually, um, although they are more, more into one topic, something like demographic and health survey, it's on fertility. But they have what I call it, uh, uh, what do you call it, a jewelry box called household roost, in which they gather information about all the members in the household. Education, labor force, everything. Besides, there's specific surveys, also representative for young people, that we have it, and we have one round that this one was in 2009, now they are feeling the second one. So trust me, I know that. <laughs> um, we were talking about ideology and uh, economic, um, socioeconomic changes and whether politicians would pay attention to the, to the interaction of them. What's happening, what happened in Egypt is that we have uh, this kind of a division in which uh, the civil society were working on the socioeconomic and the consequences of all the, what's happening in Egypt. The government was going into another way. That's why I said in the beginning, I'm going to tell you why the revolution happened. People were suffering, the government were going into the other side. I cannot talk about the three years that's passed since the, uh, the revolution because I can't see any achievement. Any. I know that there is there's going to be an achievement. I'm, I'm trusting that. But up till now, we, have, we are in the turbulence area in which we're, we're going everywhere. Um, Central generation and neglect of the elderly, uh, yes, there is neglect. You can expect that. You can find the neglect. I, I can, on top of my head, I know that uh, one researcher, I think, I can't remember the name but now, she has a research. And what she did, she did something very nice. She analyzed the content of the uh, uh, reports on family neglect in the newspaper. So all she did, she opened the newspaper every day, start looking at what happened to the elderly, based on you know people complaining, uh, accidents, anything, and she published this. I can't remember the name of the researcher, but it was a very nice piece. But still, it's very selective, very biased. I cannot tell you honest institution. But go back to my origin. I cannot generalize it because these are the reported one. There is unreported ones, there is hidden, there is the taboo, as you're saying. I cannot, I can't talk about it. 
I, I, I cannot generalize it. I cannot say, okay, 20% of our elderly are being abused. I can't say that. Okay. And these are my questions. Yeah, thank you. Second round, maybe? Here on the left. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much for both very interesting uh, presentations. I have a question to Maike von Hoeve. Um, I would like to know whether, whether you have any information on the fact I've heard that after the revolution a lot of people entered um, informal marriage arrangements in Tunisia as um, in order to put emphasis on the fact that <coughs> they um, that they um, um, turn more towards the um, traditional and Islamic way of interpreting um, family law. Um, and I would like to know if you know anything about it, and especially if you know whether those marriages entered the courts and whether um, problems arose out of these arrangements and maybe um, rulings exist on this already. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, I have two questions for Dr. Zainab. Um, the first one is um, if uh, there, in, in your statistics, if you have any appearance um, of, of single households, be it uh, men or young women um, going up, or if that is just a zero phenomenon, statistically speaking, like single households, like young men or young women living on their own, not with their parents and not getting married or if that is statistically something which appears or if it's below the 1% whatever. And the second thing is I wondered if in the numbers of the um, which you quote and which um, also are published for example in the statistical yearbook and um, are those including foreigners living in Egypt or is that just Egyptians living in Egypt? Uh, I failed to figure that out. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for Dr. Zina, and thank you very much for an amazing presentation as well. Um, the first one is, I, mean, I understand you gave a lot of socioeconomic factors, statistical factors on uh, how the roles of uh, what men and women change within the family and the kind of uh, obligations that women have to fill, being more on the uh, sandwich generation side. I just wonder if um, there is any significance whatsoever in the past 30 years, I would imagine, of the Islamists uh, on the uh, reinforcement of traditions or uh, calling it religious beliefs um, that creates this kind of situation for women or not. I mean, I was just kind of wondering if they have any significance in that in this issue. The other question relates to um, the fact that now family has changed. Um, being more on the extended side, um, how, has this got any bearings on uh, the issue of violence against children, um, or not? You know, moral and physical violence, and has this um, because it does actually kind of reflect something about the future of family dynamics as well. Hello, my name is Ali. Um, I just want to, uh, uh, to, to tell you my opinion as a young um, man here in Cairo. Uh, I think all what we need is love and life and revolution. <laughs> <laughs> we just need a revolution against the um, marriage traditions here in Egypt. We young people, we don't have, um, the most of young people, don't have the power to just take the decision whether they want to get married with the girl he loves or the boys she loves. Because the power, the family has the power. Why? Because the first, because of the traditions. First, the second, when we don't, as a young people, we don't accept these traditions, they will say, okay, so just try to find your, uh, or try to buy your own flat. Because the most families in Egypt buy just the, 
flats for the young people here in Egypt because the most of us can't afford buying a flat uh, before the 13, 13 age. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why what I mean when a young uh, boy is going to get a married, when I married from when I married from this uh, girl, uh, the family will say, okay, we, are you? The first question will be, uh, do you have a flat? The first answer will be no. The second uh, question, okay, do you have a good job where you take uh, uh, 5,000 pounds? The second answer would be no. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, and the, the third one, okay, so, uh, can, can, where, when you want to buy a flat, where, when will it be? Uh, when are you, when, when can you marry my daughter and so on? He will say, okay, I can marry here after, I would say, five or six years when he is good in, when he has a good job a normal job we would say okay in 10 years <laughs> that's why the decision will be go out that's what we mean but i think we can make it somehow easier the family can say okay you can rent a flat you can uh, begin your life you can do anything but you don't want to do that the family want that the daughter get married but when they say, when they tell uh, their neighbors or friends, yeah, we have uh, that we our daughter get married from a young man, and they are living in rent, rent uh, department, uh, apartment. The family, uh, the neighbors and the friends will laugh and will say, ah, it's very bad. I, I can tell you, my daughter get married from a very rich man, and they, they have a wonderful flat in Zamalek at Neil and so on. So it will be reflected to the life of this girl and uh, boy. She will, uh, the, the wife will try to tell her daughter, yeah, uh, your wife uh, have to buy you a good flat, have to work more, and so on. So the man will work more and more and more. He will not have any more time for his uh, wife, and the wife will be sitting at home. She want uh, her man to get care of him. Just, just want to really nice. I just want to really nice. <laughs> just want really to clarify it. That's why I just need some statistic for the power of families here in Egypt uh, over their young people. Yeah, thank you for the very short question. <laughs> yeah, Professor Zaina. Oh yes. Uh, okay. Uh, documentation of uh, single women or single men living alone. Uh, the proportion is so small. Okay, so we usually, actually we look at it for the elderly, which is okay, because it's, it's about 8%, but for young people, it's not that much, okay? Uh, Islamists and uh, how the Islamists is affecting the socioeconomic and how they can prevail. I'm going to tell you something. I'm doing a research now about early marriage in urban settings, which is not supposed to be a problem. We're urban settings. Uh, here's the dilemma. Uh, fathers and mothers want to marry their daughters early, before age 16. Okay, They are willing to do that. The problem in the urban setting is that the suitors are not prepared. As our young man indicated, they don't have a job. They don't have an income. So they're going to either rely on their father or their mother. So the daughter will go live with her mother. In mother-in-law in urban setting, is not accepted. When the Islamists start talking about early marriage as it's OK, and they start talking about why not marrying the young daughter? It became a fear because once the economic situation of those young men improve by an inch, early age of marriage will be prevailing. And we don't need that. I, actually, I, I, we don't need a young child having a young child because in Egypt we don't wait. It's You have to prove that you're fertile. Okay, so you married at age 15, you have to be to have a child by age 16. That's it. If you can have it by age 15, this would be great, but thank God we have nine months period. So, this is the impact of the Islamist. 
and this is one of my scare that they were, and they have a voice now. Think of it, in Egypt, Islamists have a voice. They were under the ground for a very long time. Now they have a voice and they think this is our right and we're gonna defy the government. So think if the economic status improved, it's as if I'm say, praying to God, don't improve the economic status in Egypt because this would increase the early marriage. And this is urban areas. So think about the situation in rural areas. Okay. Violence against children because of uh, two crownness. Actually, I cannot talk about this because I don't have data about it. But let me talk ab about it as a, as a mother and a grandmother. <laughs> a young man was talking about revolution in love. So uh, I don't think living in an extended household would result in a violence on the country. There is so many boundaries. You cannot cross grandmother by screaming in your child, but you cannot trust the grandfather by screaming in your child. So boundaries are there. This is as a mother, okay? <laughs> uh, revolution in love, yes, by all means. However, as you were talking, I'm gonna reflect back to being a mother, okay? A mother of a young woman. And I'm thinking, okay, I was thinking exactly the same when I was his age, but now when I have a daughter, I th start to think, I need to protect my daughter. So let's talk in about 30 years when you have a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's this kind of, I'm not saying, I'm, yani, by all means, you're a good man, you are, you are, you are, but demands of life, is so huge on you. I understand that. I'm fully understanding what you're going through. It's also the demands of life in, in our culture that after marrying, you have to have a children. After five years, you have to put them in school. Who's going to put them in school? You or me? I'm the, maybe I'm your mother-in-law. Who's going to put them in school? It's your responsibility. So we're looking in the future. Who's going to take the responsibility? Maybe I can barely afford to put, you know, to marry my daughter. How are you gonna put your kids in school? Are you gonna put them in the governmental school that we were just talking about it? Broken windows, broken seats, crowdless, uh, instructor irrespectable, they can head the kid, the child, or are you gonna put them in middle class schools? Which cost? Any, uh, any, I'm, I'm feeling for you, but coming back to the mother, saying, okay, let's meet in 30 years. I'm gonna be too old to discuss with you, so <laughs> you're gonna be happy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, about the informal marriages. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely have heard about it. And my feeling about this is that it is um, a, s a small phenomenon that is blown up in the media in this tendency of blowing up everything that is like Islamist and Salafist and so terrible. So this is a tendency in Tunisia. Um, there are no figures about informal marriage because they're informal. There are no court rulings about this phenomenon yet. Um, but um, just to reflect a little bit more on it, so when the media talk about these informal marriages, they put a picture of two Salafists, like a Nikabi woman and a guy in the, in the white thing. Whereas you can also think informal marriage is also a means for people who are pious Muslims to be able to have sex before having a formal marriage, right? Especially in Tunisia, where um, you have to have, you have to register your marriage. And I do have information about those court rulings. In Tunisia, having an informal marriage is prohibited by law. You go to prison for three months, which by courts is interpreted in a very large way in the sense that people who are cohabiting, so people who do not abide by traditional rules of not wanting to cohabit before marriage, so people, our generation, who want to cohabit before marriage, go to prison for unmarried, for, inf for contracting an informal marriage. But so actually what I want to say is this whole debate about informal marriages looks at it in a way as to delegitimate the Islamists and the Salafists, whereas I think there's much more at stake. So perhaps uh, two more final questions. Hi, 
Hi, it's for uh, Professor Zainab. Um, there's a demographic pressure across the board, it seems, from your presentation. Would you say this is uh, generated by the culture, or is it a result of the culture? Which, which way does it, uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is there, is there a kind of pressure uh, because of the family, uh, certain family values on, on young people having certain requirements? And the second question, would you be calling for a major revolution of this conservative patriarchy that you mentioned earlier? Uh, because that's, this kind of sounds what it sounds like. Uh, Are, are you, it sounds like you're calling for a radical change to a conservative society. Is that, uh, is that the result of, your, of, of, of would that be your conclusion? And uh, maybe a third one, um, <clears throat> given that we seem to be moving back towards a patriarch, having a patriarchal leader, do you think that's something that uh, is going to be possible anytime soon in Egypt? Okay. Last question. So who wants it? <laughs> okay, then we have two more. Uh, this, this question is directed to uh, Professor Zinab. Uh, you said that the uh, average size of the Egyptian family has gone down from seven to three. And also, uh, marriage is less and divorce is more, and in spite of all that, uh, we have a tremendous increase in the population. So from where does it come, this tremendous increase in the population? And uh, I think that uh, one of the major problems our society is facing is the, the tremendous increase in the population. Uh, we have more people than jobs available, and also this puts pressure on the economy. So how can we limit this increase in the population? Uh, thanks very much for the presentations. Um, my question is here. Question that I make only one is directed to you, Professor uh, Zainab. Um, from the presentation, I could see that you were looking more at the demographic side of the Egyptian family, and you were talking more about uh, how the economic situation and demography interconnect together. Um, I was more a little bit more interested in the way that you connect the um, patriarchal state and with society. And uh, if you think uh, that uh, at the level of, uh, at the legislative level, so a matter of laws in Egypt, uh, uh, maybe let me rephrase, how um, would you improve the current laws towards the family and personal status code for um, single mothers, for example? I know there is a big issue with single mothers, especially uh, because there is no enforcement for uh, Husbands to to provide for them. I mean, that's what I could hear from talking to people around. Thanks very much. Five statement to the crowd. Okay, questions are getting harder. So stop questions. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> Patriarchy. Your questions is all about the patriarchy, and actually, the last question is talking about the patriarchy of the state. What the state is doing for us? Um, okay, we need a revolution, as you're saying, a social revolution. You're, you're, you're saying, I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> as you, as you're rephrasing my words. <laughs> We need a social revolution. We need to change our way of thinking. We need to change all, not to change, but redefine culture a bit, to loosen it a bit. Because I think we have been into this situation in which people are accepting new roles while people are declining some of their roles. And this is happening on the level of the family. 
and the development of the state. What's happening in the state is that uh, for a very long time, the state finds itself relieved by the action of the civil society. So now, if you listen to the Egyptian TV, you're going to find that enormous amount of you know, advertisement asking for donation for cancer, for heart disease, for, for, so where is the state from that? Supposedly, a state should be doing this, but now the civil society is interfering, and once the civil society is interfering, the state raises its hands and say, okay, you're doing well, continue with what you're doing. Although they are constraining their, their movement, which is, again, another subject that we can talk about. So patriarchal society, see the reflection in the family. We have the patriarchy, uh, the man in the house. I'm not going to generalize, but some of them are declining the roles as patriarchy, as long as the woman is doing it. So you find that the woman is working, three chefs that we talk about. She's bringing money in the house. She's sharing in the budget of the house. She's sharing her brothers in supporting her, uh, her older parents. So all this kind of sharing, nobody would acknowledge and say, you're doing such a good job. On the contrary, you find the husband complaining, the children complaining, the parents complaining, and the boss at work is always complaining because she's not doing such a good job. There is no relief for this woman. This is what I'm, I'm being, you know, boundering on every talk saying, guys, middle-aged women are squeezed and they are, you know, uh, cannot, they, there is a taboo, they cannot say that we are squeezed because shame on you, you're not taking care of your parents, shame on you, you're not taking care of your uh, husband, shame on you, you're not taking So the, the shift of roles is always against women. We need the social revolution, yes. I'm not a feminist. I have never been a feminist. Actually, I hate working, <laughs> but I am addicted to my work. I don't know how to do it. I don't know. I'm not going to say that the uh, state should interfere in the family life, but there must be some sort of a way in order to relieve this kind of pressure on the women. Question about the family and population. This is my heart in there, okay? Uh, the number of children decline? Yes. By all means, the number of children decline. The family size, it hasn't changed because as the number of children are declining, our elderly are living. So it hasn't changed that much. We are five people per household, okay? Uh, what's happening, what we call it population momentum. When you have a large number of births, those people after 15 years will be in the age of reproduction. So even if they have a small number of children, the population will increase. If, even if they have one child, the population will increase. It will never decrease until this huge cohort of large births go out of the reproduction. So that's why I have a professor who usually say, Politicians never address population problem. And we were just like, why? Because he has to survive for 30 years in order, in order to see the decline in population. And there is no politician who will survive for 30 years. Actually, we have politicians who survive. <laughs> <laughs> but thank God they didn't pay attention in the beginning of their life for that, because they were not planning to stay for 30 years. But this is it. Population momentum is like you're shifting people across ages. So 15, 0 to 15, in 15 years, it's going to be 15 to 30. Those are the ones who are responsible for reproduction. Those are huge. So even if they have one child, you still have large people in the base. Mm -hmm. Is this answering your question? And pressure, that you're saying that we're pressuring the, the uh, the economics and the social life and the policies and everything, we're pressuring it. This is yes, because we, you know, my whole problem with the old regime is that we usually talk about population problem as if it happened now. It has been happening for a very long time. You're now complaining. 
You haven't paid attention for a very long time. Now you start saying to people, it's the population explosion that causing all these problems. God, we have been studying it forever. <laughs> and we have been nagging you with numbers. And every 10 years you have a census telling you, pay attention. And actually, we, we have a successful family planning, as, as mentioned by Micah. Tunisia is having successful. We are very successful. But we reach to a, a situation in which people are not declining in three. They have two of one kind and one of the other. Two boys, one girl. And it's, it's like set. We tried even to, to investigate why it's happening that way. We couldn't find any difference. It's set that way. We have to change people's mind totally and tell them it's sufficient to have one of each. But it comes back, maybe the third one will be different. Will, will help? I don't know. So, yeah, by all means, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I diverted away, but by all means, large population, we are pressuring our resource. But it can, yeah, we have to stop there and start thinking how to use it. One of the big problems is the demographic opportunity, demographic window of opportunity, in which we have a huge cohort of young people. All the tiger, Asian tigers, they made good use of this cohort. They educated them well, they prepared them for the labor market, and that's why they are advancing very quickly. They are at the top of the world now. In our situation, with our current education system, employment, and training of the young people, we're, not, we're gonna go through this demographic window of opportunity, and we're still gonna be suffering after that. There was a question about Egyptian. Uh, I'm sorry, but that, that was a, I was looking at the uh, at one of the questions in the early uh, question. Somebody was telling me, is this about Egyptian and foreigners living in Egypt? Actually, all the survey is on Egyptians, so we exclude the foreigners. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very very much. I think. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, before uh, we transfer the event uh, outside and you can enjoy your dinner and might try to find someone to marry <coughs> in order to solve some problems we discussed today, I want to thank again Professor Zeynab and Dr. Michael. I think it was really a very interesting and likely yeah. debate. Uh, I also want to take the chance to thank uh, Christian Melcher very much who helped with the whole organization uh, of the event and then of course to our um, uh, technical magicians, yeah? Mahmoud and Ahmed, uh, Tama, Walid and Saleh were well, happening as well, but they're not here now. Um, and thank you very much for, for the attention and the audience and for coming, and I hope uh, we will see you soon in, in the next month to the next uh, Care Talk and Transformation and Change. So, thank you.